All right. Okay, so actually first there's just a miscellaneous thing. All right. Back at the uh, data directory, there is actually a data directory entry. So previously, so we're done with this now. We've X'd out the import directory thing. We already traversed all that path. There is actually a uh, little helper thing here for the OS loader that's a pointer directly to the import address table. So if you want to go, you don't want to like traverse down. So the thing is, we saw before, if you have multiple uh, modules which you're importing functions from, each of them points somewhere in the list, the overall list of uh, imported addresses, right? So you don't, rather than having the OS go through and walk each of those and try to figure out where the import address table starts, there's this little helper thing where it can like just go directly to there uh, if necessary. So this is just a miscellaneous point uh, to check this off our list. So if you want to go directly to the import address table, the very start of the import address table, you can go to whatever index this is in the, uh, whatever image directory entry IAT, whatever index that is in the data directory. Uh, that'll give you the RVA for the very beginning of the import address table. All right, so now we're going to talk about import address table hooking. So, right, when the import address table is fully resolved, it's basically just an array of function pointers uh, in your module. So telnet.exe has a, an array of function pointers. You saw them. They were all those 777s. And there's probably some other ones before that, et cetera. Somewhere in the code path, there's like one of those call instructions where it says call, you know, some offset in the table, pull that value out, and go to that address. So the problem is, what if the attacker is able to modify the import address table so that they take that value that's at that address, instead of being 77 whatever it was, what if it now points at the attacker's code? So in this case, uh, what the attacker has functionally done is he's man in the middling your calls to function. So I've started to think about a lot of um, blue kit type things in terms of that it's really like a host based man in the middle. So um, on the network, you know that if the attacker is in between you and the server, right, they can do a lot of manipulations. They can, you know, potentially break uh, SSL sessions as long as they have uh, legitimate uh, credentials and stuff like that. A lot of the rootkit things that they do in order to hide stuff from someone, what it boils down to is that they've interposed themselves on something you'd want to ask about. You want to ask the operating system, you know, is there this file there, you know? You know, what, what are the files in this directory? You ask the operating system, what are the files in the directory? The man in the middle says, oh, you want to know what files are in the directory? It's your operating system, tell me what files are in the directory. It comes back with a list and it checks that list and it says, oh, are any of those files my files? If so, remove those from the list and then pass the query back. So uh, import address table hooking is basically like, you know, if instead of uh, fill over to the, uh, over to the board, you know, if instead of pointing to, actually, I think this is the example here. So we've got, tell that the DXC may call something an ntdll.dll. There's a kernel 32. I'm not sure which one it is in this thing, but let's say that, you know, the, the user wanted to call some function in ntdll.dll, but instead the attacker came in and it took their modified, modified their import address table. Let's say the attacker is here. Sorry, Zeno, can you adjust your microphone? You put your microphone on. Yep, yep, it, uh, yep, I got you. Thanks. There we go. That should be better, maybe, until I turn that way. How's this? Better? Can you hear? All right. So let's say the attacker is, you know, somehow in the memory space of the thing he's trying to attack. And so telnet.exe, you know, it used to have an import address table thing which pointed to NTDLL. But the attacker comes in and he goes to telnet.exe and he says, no, that function is now going to point at me and I'm going to eventually, you know, call the NTDLL that you originally asked for. And so by redirecting these function calls to the attacker, you know, he's man in the middle of your function call, right? And so what we have here is we have a fun lab here where we're basically going to show how just using this user space sort of import address table hooking, uh, we can actually hide a process, for instance, in a process list from Task Manager. Okay, now just to be very clear here because this, this point comes up a bit. Again, every process is independent. The operating system is responsible 
for taking user space processes and keeping them in separate memory spaces, right? If you're an attacker and you buffer overflow telnet.exe, right, that only says something about your ability to affect all of this stuff in this memory, right? That doesn't say anything about your ability to affect calc.exe. Now, you may have a method within Windows in order to, like, write memory over to some other process. And so there's ways which you can, you know, function, you can subsequently jump from one process to the other process or into kernel and down to other processes and whatever else. But to be clear, you know, how the attacker gets into the memory space is sort of immaterial for what we're talking about right now. We're just assuming somehow the attacker is in the memory space. They may be on the stack because they did a buffer overflow. They may be on the heap because they did a buffer overflow. They may have just done DLL injection, which is what we're going to do, where they just somehow through configuring the system or calling function calls from some other thing to get in here, uh, they just have some code running in this process address space. So once you assume that they're in the process address space and they can modify, you know, the import address table of any of these things, but we'll say it's going after the main process, uh, that's when this import address table hooking becomes a problem. So, like I said, it's sort of assumed, well, one way that you can assume that this is happening is through DLL injection. And so you can see this link for, you know, which got all, format got all messed up, but you can see the link for other ways that you can achieve DLL injection. We're going to do this the simple, easy, lazy way, which works good on XP and which is a little more effort on Vista, et cetera, but not really. So there is a registry key called app init DLLs. With this registry key, basically, if you put the name of the path to a, a DLL in this registry key, it says that anytime anyone loads uh, over to the board, anytime anyone loads user32.dll, every module that's currently listed in that app init registry key will also be loaded into the memory space. Oh, and most everyone loads user32 because it has a lot of functions or it's dependent upon by other things like NTM DLL and stuff like that. So if an user32 gets loaded into the memory space, then any modules listed in this registry key also get loaded into the memory space. So, you know, if you're not monitoring changes to your registry and the attacker can somehow change the registry, then uh, he'll be able to DLL inject. So what we did here is I modified a, this project right here. So this uh, code project API hook one, it wasn't doing import address table hooking, but I just wanted to reuse some of its code. It was doing like inline hooking where, uh, sorry, Bill, over to the board again. So here I said what we're going to do in our lab is we're going to go telnet, the import address table will get pointed to attacker and that will go back to this. You know, the alternate way is that you could change nothing in the import address table, right? And you could have something where, you know, this still points there. But then that points to attacker and then, uh, yep, and then attacker eventually points back to like there and, and then that eventually returns to whoever called it. But, but the original that thing was inline hooking where they basically took and put like jump instructions at the address of a particular function. So here we're hooking um, NT query system information. That's something in where is it? Does it say there? I think it's in NTDLL. I think it's in NTDLL, but maybe it's kernel 32. So anyways, um, just lost my train of thought. So anyways, we're hooking this uh, NT query system information. The original one would go directly to the first address of that, put a jump instruction which jumps to the attacker. Instead, we're going to modify the import address table. So I put the steps in here and let's, let's see if uh, people can follow these along just to see if your, uh, if your compilation environment is working or not because we'll need it later as well. So what I need people to do is uh, if you grab the code from my um, home folder, in uh, life of binaries, there is now a life of binaries folder to double deep. And then you're looking for life of binaries.sln, so this solution file. And when you double click that, you're going to uh, open up Individual Studio. And you should see something like this, more or less. So I have the original one here if you want to go look through it. It's uh, more complicated actually than ours because he had to add in like libraries to disassemble the first instructions at the function he's trying to hook and stuff like that. So. Import address table hooking is actually quite a bit easier, but 
That one is much more generic. So that thing can hook anything. This can only hook things which are imported. So anyways, you've got import address app init hook IAT. Uh, right click on that and set that as startup project so that it becomes bold. All right, so now uh, you can just go up and, um, I mean, you can, well, I, that's all right. I guess I'm going to go through the code just very quickly just to show that this is an example where the attacker obviously has to know how the PE is structured in order to go find the import address table. Oh, if the attacker knows more than you, they win. <coughs> All right, so basically, uh, the basic, let's see. So we start with DLL main. I said that in, um, in DLLs, you optionally have this DLL main function, which is the first thing that's going to get called when it gets loaded into memory. So we know that in our, in our uh, circumstance that we're thinking about, we're just modifying a registry key so that this DLL will always get loaded into memory whenever someone loads user32.dll. So there's different reasons that this DLL main can be called. It can say like there's a new process just got loaded, there's a new thread that just got loaded. Because the whole point of the DLL main is basically to put any code that needs to initialize, uh, you know, variables and stuff like that for the library put it in there so that if it sees a new thread got loaded, then it will uh, initialize variables for that thread or whatever. So anyways, the main thing is this hook IAT entry for ND query system information. Mark, you missing something or no? no okay. Gotcha. All right, so I'm going to go to the definition of that. So you can right click, go to definition or just select them up here. All right, and this is the core aspect of um, this is the core functionality of this malicious DLL. The first thing that it's going to do is it has this find this process address base. So it's like this DLL got loaded into somewhere. Uh, over to the board, please. The DLL got loaded into some module, some address space. It doesn't know where it got loaded. It doesn't know what thing. It's just always going to get loaded for every new process that executes. The first thing it does is it consults this find uh, Find this process base address is saying it's looking for whatever this main module is in this address space. It's looking for telnet, it's looking for calc, et cetera. And how it does that, you know, I'm not going to dig into that. No, I'll dig into it because I really want me to. Um, how it does it is the OS keeps some data structures. It basically keeps information like this in the linked list somewhere. So we saw before when we opened up WinDebug, it had this all these addresses of all these locations, right? All the debugger was doing was just printing out some data structures in a linked list. For each module, there's this loaded modules list that says, you know, telnet is the first thing that gets loaded. It's the first entry in the list. Then it goes, you know, the OS goes to the imports and says, oh, I see you need NTDLL. So that becomes the second thing. And then NTDLL, you know, is user 32 and that's the third thing. So every module in here is going to be in this loaded module list. And basically what the attacker code does is it goes to that list and it says whatever the first thing in that list is, I think that's going to be the executable. You know, it's just assuming at this point, right? It could do some sanity checking if it wants. But it basically is just assuming that because of the load ordering, because you double click to this exe, that's going to be the first thing in the OS's list of loaded modules. So that's what this find this process base address does. And if we dig into here, we'll see some delightful assembly code which I'm not entirely going to explain, but this basically, I'm not going to explain it at all, actually. Because uh, you've got a bunch of comments and you can read those comments, which mostly just link you to this paper. So go read that paper. Uh, actually, no, that's even, that's not even the main paper because this is modified version, so, oh well. Uh, the main thing is this is just saying it knows that this data structure will always be able to be found starting at you know, this FS register there goes to that. And it's basically just dereferencing its way through some structures until it finds the first thing. The only reason I went into this in order, instead of just saying it, is that code very similar to this is used for shellcode. Uh, so that when an attacker injects shellcode into a process, if they want to, for instance, um, find the address of some function they want to call like virtual protect or malloc or something like that, um, they can then go and like search for something like kernel32.dll, which is a very useful um, module that has a bunch of uh, things like changing memory protections, opening files, closing files. Kernel32 basically is the user space side of 
how you can call to a bunch of kernel space functions like opening files, closing files, stuff like that. So anyways, this little snippet of assembly code that I've written here, that's just, you know, five instructions of inline assembly or whatever it is, this will basically go find the loaded module address list and then go immediately to the very first entry in that list. And so what this is going to return in this case for telnet.exe, the return value from this will be 0100000. It's going to give you the base address of the main process in the memory space wherever it got loaded. So what it does is it says exe base equals whatever that base address is returned by that. And then from there, it says, okay, I got the base address of a module. I'm going to parse my way through the data structures in order to find the import address table. And specifically, I'm looking for something, uh, I'm looking for a specific entry, this NT query system information. And that's the one which it wants to replace with that function pointer. Instead, it wants it to point to its own function. And so this, uh, yeah. So the long and the short of it is that, you know, it's, well, it sanity checks to make sure it can find the NTDLL. It then goes and finds the function pointer. And what this function pointer is being used for, what it's subverting in this case, is something like taskmanager.exe. When you call that and it gives you that list of loaded processes, running processes, right? So you see in task manager, here's, you know, calc and here's, uh, you know, explorer.exe. That list actually comes back. That's the return value from this NT query system information. So you pass them, you call NT query system information with a certain input, and the OS gives you back a list of all the loaded processes. So if the attacker meant... So anyways, um, it's going around and it's basically looking, this while loop right here is basically just walking through the import address table and it's saying, while this particular IAT entry, you know, if that's ever equal to the function pointer address for the real original, uh, the real NT query system information. If it's that, then I'm going to break out of my loop and I know, okay, well, this IAT entry points at the address of the import address table entry. And then I'm just going to fill that in with my fake value after I uh, change the memory permissions on the virtual memory because the import address table is not writable after the OS writes it when it starts it up, but then it marks it as non-writable after that. So this attacker needs to mark it as writable and then change it. And so once he does that, the ultimate thing is just this assignment right here where it says, go to memory at this import address table thing and put in hooked NT query system information. And this is the modified one. And, you know, I haven't really looked through this, but just by skimming it, I can see, well, it's looking for calc.exe. And so I know that this code is actually going to hide calc.exe from the list of running processes. So, what we're going to do is we're going to compile this DLL and then put it into the registry key and then see that taskmanager.exe is subverted. So you could right click on app init hook IAT and go to build. And you should get one succeeded. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go back out to our desktop where this uh, life of binaries is. And under the debug folder, there will be a DLL now. So it should be like on your desktop, code, life of binaries, life of binaries, debug. And there should be a DLL. Eponit hook iat.dll. So don't go into the project, like at the highest level, right? So do not click into the folder called the app init hook IAT. Just at the highest level, life of binaries where the .sln file is, go into debug at that level. And that's where you'll find the DLL. And so just for simplicity's sake, we're going to copy this to C colon slash, just so that the path is nice and easy. I'm going to copy that. I'm going to open up colon slash. I'm going to paste that there. Just drag and drop it or paste it, whatever. So now when you're done with this, you should have app init hook iat.dll in c colon slash. And then go ahead and open up regedit. So from start menu run regedit.exe.
And then in regedit, I'm going to go a bit slow here because this is, you know, a bit deep. All right, from H key local machine, and then software. H key local machine, software, Microsoft. <coughs> H key local machine, software, Microsoft, then Windows NT. And current version. There's only one option under NT, current version. H key local machine, software, Microsoft, Windows NT, current version, Windows. And then you'll see in that Windows folder the uh, app init underscore DLLs registry key. <coughs> All right, so go ahead and put C colon slash app init uh, IAT hook or whatever it's called, dot DLL in there. So double click on the app init DLL and then under value data, put C colon slash app init hook IAT dot DLL. And now don't hit OK on that yet. So once you do that, once you hit OK, every new process that gets opened will have that being. But we want to be like, so we want to be very clear on like that this change has actually happened. So before we set this registry key, right, let's run calc.exe. Right, so we run calc.exe and we run task manager by either hitting control alt delete and selecting task manager or by just going to run task manager. I'm having troubles here. Oh, wow. Awesome. Off to the side. There we go. Kind of. So, under task manager, under processes. Now, this is specifically sort the processes by image name, and you'll see calc.exe. Only this list is what is coming back from NT query system information. And we'll see that when we hack this, calc.exe will disappear from here, but it won't disappear from applications because this list is not what it's coming back from. This is from somewhere else. So just the process list will be having this executable hidden. But of course, you know that you know, there's plenty of processes in here that are not showing up under applications. So it's not as if you can't just make your process non-visible. So anyways, task manager, you should be in processes tab. You should have it sorted by name. And you should see calc.exe. So then you have calc.exe open. All right. So now we're going to close this and we're going to hit OK on that registry change. And once we do that, the next time that we open task manager, so run task manager, task MGR, the next time we run task manager, calc.exe doesn't show up here because, right, it's, it's a rootkit. This is a non-weaponized rootkit. This is uh, what user space rootkits are, and we'll get into uh, this a bit more when we have the rootkits class. But, um, yeah, so the whole point is this list just comes back from this single function, right? And so all the rootkit has to, well, all the malware has to do is interpose itself on your call to that function. You say, give me the list of processes. It takes that and says, okay, they're looking for the list of processes. I'll go ask the operating system. I'll check the list when it comes back. And if I see calc.exe, I will remove it from the list and then I'll pass it back to the user, right? And so if we want to see this actually, like really see the change where it's actually happening, uh, we can then go ahead and open WinDebug and we can like go look at the import address table. So I'm going to close Task Manager. I'm going to open WinDebug, but WinDebug is actually going to get hooked as well, but that's okay. Oh wait, no, that's not okay because then I can't open it in WinDebug. Yes, good. Let's show that. 
All right, so I'm going to go to all programs, debugging tools, win debug, and I'm going, oh, I know what I wanted to do. Yeah, oh well. Okay, I'm just going to run task manager first. All right, so I've got task manager running. Task manager can't see calc.exe. I've got win debug running, and now I want to take win debug and I want to attach to the running task manager. It's already running, it's already hooked. So I'm going to attach to task manager. But, oh good, it is there. Never mind then. Yeah, so it can actually attach. So for some reason I was thinking it was like, it was being hooked as well and couldn't see it. But it could be, there we go. So first of all, what exactly did you attach to the task manager? I attach the debugger. So basically, OS's are, you know, for debugging purposes, OS for debugging purposes, the OS is going to export some API where it can say, like, debuggers can attach, they can read memory, they can maybe write memory, and stuff like that. So the point is, WinDebug is using the OS API to say, dear API, let me, you know, attach to this process. So the first thing I can see here is that, uh, Oh, right, I can't move that anymore because I, uh, it stopped. That's going to be inconvenient in a second. Right. I'm going to make this small. Okay, it doesn't want to go any smaller. I'll make it small horizontally then. I run WinDebug, I go attach to process, I go select task manager.exe, attach to it, and so first of all we can see the app init hook iat.dll loaded into its address space, right? This is what enables, uh, enables the code to like go in, change the import address table and redirect it over to their code. And so this, you know, in and of itself, one could think, you know, one, one possible remediation for things like DLL injection is to profile executables and understand, you know, what possible processes are within their loaded memory space. But uh, that can get quite complicated. So the other thing we can do is we can go in and we can say, uh, let's go look at its import address table and see, you know, does it look like it's even pointing into the right module, for instance. That's one heuristic. Um, let's see, what am I going to do? I'm going to open up task manager in PView so that I can cheat and go find the import address table for the anti-query system information. So, The task manager is actually, you know, just in C colon Windows System 32 like, like the other things were. So C colon Windows System 32. I can open that in PView. I can, you know, cheat and go find the import address table directly. I can be annoyed by the fact that task manager is in my way. And then I can scroll down to ntdll.dll, right? So actually the nice thing here is that PView, right, this last entry, this is just zero, zero, zero. That's just terminating this thing. But P view is being nice and it's saying, hey, all of this array above that zero, 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 these were all the functions imported from ADV API 32. These are all the functions imported from COM CTL 32, et cetera. So I can just keep scrolling down until I find uh, ntdll.dll. I think that's it. Oh, this is 32. There we go. Looks like it's at the very bottom. Right, so within this, I'm looking for this one right there, NT query system information. So this is the thing in the import address table. It's saying, well, I'm going to change this to RVA view up here. Change that to RVA view, and it's saying, at RVA 1448 into task manager.exe, that's the import address table entry for NT query system information. And so if I go and look at my process that I've attached to at offset 1448, right? So WinDebug is telling me 
Task manager is at base address 10000. Same as telnet. Copy that. I'm going to make a memory window again. Split to the top of my screen. Put in the base address plus 1448. Oops. <coughs> right. So this value right here is the RVA into my attacking module. So if I go down and look at the modules list, it says appinate hook is loaded at base address 10000000, right? So that's the base address of appinate hook.dll. And this is like RVA hex 1000 into that module. So it's just saying right now, NT query system information import address table thing is pointing into completely the wrong module. And, uh, and that's why it looks so different from all the other things that it's around, right? So I go like that, for instance, right? Here's a normal NTDLL address. It's 7C9 something. Here's another one, 7C9 something. And then all of a sudden there's this random address that's in the 10000 range. And then we go back to 7C9, 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 7C9. Okay, null. That's the end of all those addresses, right? And so you know, this kind of uh, sticks out like a sore thumb here, basically. So, you know, it's worth understanding that the attacker, you know, this does stick out like a sore thumb. I can go through and just, you know, go into every module and I can say, I can go look at its import address table and say, look, does this look, does it even point into the right module? If it doesn't point into the module, okay, easy. Someone modified it. If it does point into the right module, I can still go further in sanity check and go to NTDLL and say, where does NTDLL say that it exports it? What offset? And then, you know, check whether this is the right offset into NTDLL. So, um, looking at the import address table can potentially alert us to uh, these sort of things. But in practice, no one does. And therefore, uh, most of the time you're not going to find this sort of thing. So anyways, any questions on the attacking of task manager and uh, modifying its view of loaded modules. You know, anyone have any questions on uh, how we uh, modified the import address table? In the module, you know, this was rather than telnet, it was task manager in this case, but actually it was, it was doing it to every process that launched after that, theoretically. I don't know why it wasn't doing it for Windows, but. So again, any, uh, any questions on the import address table stuff before we go on and we're going to start uh, digging into alternate ways, well, not alternate necessarily, but uh, some additional enumeration over the import stuff. Any other questions? Anyone on the phone? Yeah, Bill, could you zoom on this in on this quick? I'll just, you know, show roughly what I'm, uh, yeah, so a little bit back. And a little more, that's good. Yeah, all I was trying to show here was, um, you know, whereas the original line may have been blue, the telnet.exe or taskmanager.exe, they may have called, you know, NTDLL. An attacker can modify this so that instead we take out the blue path and we insert the green path so that it redirects to attacker and the attacker redirects to the original. Or if they feel like it, they could just re-implement whatever function. They need not necessarily redirect to the original. There's a little bit of... Uh, implementation option there, depending on what they're trying to do. So that's all I was showing with that, just redrawing it a little clearer. All right, so we're going to go on quick to um, a variant on this import address table stuff where actually all of the import address table is already filled in on disk. So do, do, do. let's see, bound imports, that's what we're talking about next. All right. So we said, as, as far as we're concerned right now, uh, for normal imports, I'm going to just call them normal imports. What you have is, even though they're not this, you know, Microsoft stuff is all like this instead. The normal imports, you got your import names table that points at that hint and then string. 
you got your import address table, it points at the exact same hint and then string when they're on disk. When they get in memory, then we go ahead and we fill them in with the absolute virtual address of all those functions that we want to call in whatever, in whatever other modules. Bound imports is basically just saying to the linker, linker, go ahead and assume that all of the modules I'm importing will get their desired base address. So assume that NTDLL will get, you know, 7C900000. Assume user32.dll will get 7E41000. Linker should assume that, and if it assumes that, the linker can then, the linker rather than the OS loader, can go walk the exports table for each of those modules, find the relative offset into it, and take that exact same absolute virtual address that the OS loader would have calculated, and just stick that directly into the import address table on disk so that basically when you load Notepad or whoever else, it already has its import address table already filled in under the assumption that as long as none of its modules get moved around. And that's again why Microsoft went around and like made sure that all of their modules were at non-overlapping addresses so that they could say that most of the time that will hold true. So ultimately, um, bound imports and binding is just a speed hack. It's saying rather than have the OS loader at load time walk around all the modules and find all the function pointers and fill them in, tell the linker at link time, fill them in, and then the OS loader at load time will check whether, you know, generally speaking, it looks like the module is still the right version at the right base address. And if so, leave them alone. If not, just do what it would have done anyways, but you're, you're not really any worse off for having done just a couple quick sanity checks before doing what you would have done anyways. All right, so this is a new uh, location within our data directory. It has its own uh, data directory entry. <coughs> it's the image entry bound import thing. And so it's not on this picture, unfortunately. But, you know, this is going to then, you know, point off to some other metadata. And so specifically what it's pointing at is this structure image bound import descriptor. So just like for the regular imports, there was that array of descriptors, right? So they had first thunk, they had original thunk, they had name, stuff like that. So regular imports points at that array of descriptors. Bound imports, uh, it also points at an array of descriptors. And for now, all we're going to care about is the time date stamp. This, what this time date stamp is, is it's saying that this is the time date stamp for the module, which I'm assuming is going to be loaded at the base address that uh, it wants. So basically, it's Here's the first instance where we see the OS itself or linker itself, however you want to say it. Here's where we see the system itself treating the time date stamp as if it were a unique version information for a given file. So it's like this, this time date stamp is here specifically just so that at load time, the operating system can just check is the time date stamp the same one that the linker linked against. So this time date stamp here is basically in the header file saying this is the time date stamp I linked against. And at load time, the OS needs to check, is the user 32.dll the same version, you know, is the time date stamp in the file header of user 32.dll the same one as the time date stamp in the image bound import descriptor of, you know, notepad.exe or whoever? Question. That can be changed, you said, right? I said that can be changed. Yeah, I mean, so if, if and okay. so that's exactly the point. So if my notepad.exe was bound against a specific version of user32.dll. If Microsoft releases an updated user32.dll, all of these bound imports will become invalidated, but everything else will still be the same. So for everything else, it'll still, you know, for all those other modules that didn't change, they're if still fine. Changed a module and converted the right, if you kept the you could if you knew that none of the functions, none of the, so actually I'm, uh, I'm making a simplifying assumption here. Well, I'm making a simplification here. I'm saying to you that this is, it's checking against the time date stamp in the, um, in the file header, but in reality it's checking against the one in the export header, which we haven't learned about yet. So it turns out you can recompile something, but nothing about your exported functions changes. In that case, the exported time date stamp would not change, but the file header one might. So yes, there could certainly be an instance where you could, that's how it has built in the ability to 
recompile stuff without invalidating bindings, basically. All right. So we're going to return to the rest of those values later, but for now we just think there's some array of descriptors where they have timestamps in them saying, this is the timestamp of the module that I'm linking against. Actually, yeah, I should have probably include the module name. I think I was kind of inconsistent with some of the uh, highlighting of We care about that, but I started like not not calling out that we care about things when they're just a name because you'll see when you look through it, it's the name of the module. It's user32.dll. So. so yeah, here we go. Here's, uh, here's an example of this array, right? So pView went and it looked at that bound import uh, descriptors entry in the uh, data directory and it figured out that, okay, this offset where this bound import directory table is listed in PEView. This offset, you know, 250 is where this array of descriptors is. And so all it really has is, oops, a time date stamp saying, and then a name. And so it's saying like, my notepad.exe was bound against comdlg32.dll with this specific version. It was bound against shell32.dll with this specific version. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so, uh, yeah, we don't care about that. Can we come back and talk about it? So the main point is just you've got this array of descriptors where they're much simpler than those import descriptors since their only point is to let the OS loader do a sanity check to say, is the COM32 DL, COM32 DLG, no, COM DLG32 DLL, is this module that I'm about to read off of disk and load into the module address space, is that one which I'm putting in memory the same time date stamp as the one which this executable was linked to, uh, bound against? If it was not, then I need to go fix up all those imports. If it was, then go ahead and leave them alone because they're all going to be the right address. And so how we see this actually in something like Notepad is, all of those addresses look like they're, you know, out in some other module address space, you know, 77D, XXXX, no. <coughs> 0, 01, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, Oops, did I click that in? Oh, sorry. I'm looking at the virtual address. It's, this is the actual function pointer. Well, 77, you know, D something, 773 something, etc. And so it's basically saying, Go ahead and assume that comdlg will be loaded at 773 something something something. And then under that assumption, for a current, you know, for a specific time date stamp of this DLL, I will assume that, you know, the offset into that will be DD270 or whatever it's going to be. I'll add the base address plus that offset. I'll create an absolute virtual address and I'll just stick it right into this. So these are just the exact same addresses which the OS loader should theoretically calculate at load time but you can just put them in at link time as long as you assume that the module is going to be loaded in the same place. <coughs> and then the only thing I wanted to show here is that this changed slightly from, well, actually let's, uh, let's show, let's open two things in um, PView. So I guess I still have my beep.sys open in PView and I'm going to actually, maybe I'll do like telnet and notepad or something. I'm going to open Telnet and Notepad in PView. They're both in C colon Windows System 32. And I'm just going to show, just kind of highlight the differences between both of their import address tables. So this bound import directory, this is just some other data structure, some other array of, uh, of descriptors elsewhere in the module. But if we go to their actual import address table, or actually I want to start with the import directory table. So if I go to the import directory table for each of them, this is what we've seen thus far. Telnet.exe, we've got, you know, our, we, all we've focused on thus far is the, you know, pointer to the import names table, pointer to the import address table, and then we said there's an RVA that points at a string which says this is msvct.dll. And we've just kind of been ignoring these two fields and we say that's always zero and that's always zero. Okay, they're not always zero. If you have bound imports, then they turn out to be negative one. So they're FFFFF. 
And what that's saying is, hey, OS, I know you're going to, you know, try to be resolving some imports for COMDLG, but this negative one is telling you, you better go and check for some bound, imp you better check some bound import information because if the bound import information says you don't need to change anything, then your job is done. You don't have to do anything. So the negative one says you got bound imports and then the OS loader would go out and it would say, okay, let's look at this data table and then it would need to say, all right, for the com DLG 32.dll that's on disk, I'm going to, you know, I know I'm going to read that into memory because I need to have the actual function implementations in memory in some other module. Um, and so now let me just sanity check, is the one which I'm reading off of disk into memory, does it have a time date stamp of this? If so, don't have to worry about resolving anything in the import address table. So that's kind of the long and the short of bound imports. But I'm sure I have more stuff. But it still has to import those, those functions, right? It's not exactly. So it still has to, exactly, yes. It's not statically linked. It still has to import the functions, right? So that's why you have, the OS loader still needs to take those things, those modules off of disk and put them into memory. So you still got to load up comdlg32, you still got to load up shell32, but you don't have to fix up the import address table, right? But you still need the code that actually implements those functions. All right. Yep. So I think, well, can I get through it? I don't know. All right. So there's the question of, um, so first of all, we just saw Notepad, for instance, has bound imports, right? So Microsoft said, all right, I'm going to bind the imports of Notepad so that Notepad opens up faster because the OS loader won't have to go out and find all those function pointers, right? So there's the question of uh, how do you actually bind your imports? So say you have your executable, how can you bind your imports to make it run faster? Well, there's the bind image X API if you want to do it programmatically, if you want to have like my program read some other program and it like fixes up its import address table. That's fine. If you want to do it that way, I don't know why you would do it that way. I'm sure there's reasons. There's uh, the Windows installer has a bind image action. And this one sort of makes sense. It's saying, if you're trying to install some software at install time, rather than link time, for instance, at install time, go out and look at all of those other modules on the operating system right now and assume they're going to get loaded at their addresses and fill in the function pointers for my executable, right? That makes a lot of sense because, you know, if you compile it back on your operating system, you've got whatever, you know, whatever, um, DLL versions you have on your development operating system. But when you go out and you install to, you know, your users' operating systems, they don't necessarily have the same versions, right? So doing it at install time makes a lot of sense because, and I would guess that actually the Windows installer or, you know, updater or something is actually using this. But um, so, you know, when it installs the update or something like that, then it would go out and it would say, okay, for all of the DLLs on the system currently, just resolve function pointers and stick them into Notepad and you know, whatever else is bound. So theoretically, you could use this executable called bind.exe. Uh, this isn't available anymore. It doesn't seem to be available anymore with the development environments like the newer Visual Studios. So this definitely was available. I saw lots of references to it with old versions like Visual Studio 6. But now with like Visual Studio 9, which is what we have on ours, there is no bind.exe. Theoretically, back in the day, you would just run bind.exe and then your executable, and then it would go out and it would like fill in all the function pointers. So, since there is no bind.exe in our things, we're actually going to use CFX, CFF Explorer quick in order to bind Hello World. So, we're going to go compile Hello World. We're going to look at the imports for Hello World to see that, okay, by default, it does not bind it. And then we're going to use this thing to like tell it, okay, force those imports to be bound. So, uh, da, da, da. so over in uh, the Life of Binaries Visual Studio solution, we can right click on Hello World and set that as the startup project. And then we just right click on it to build it. And 
in, it compiled, linked, and built. It's all good. Now I'm going to uh, open it in PE view. And so where it should be is on your desktop, code, life of binaries, <coughs> life of binaries. And then again, don't click into hello world. Just click into debug. And so you'll see hello world there. And so one interesting thing here is that we see now an iData section, which I had said before. Theoretically, the iData section is where all your imports data is. And so if I actually expand the iData section, okay, yes, there's all my directory table, names table, address table, and the actual strings and hints and stuff, right? But in all of those other executables we looked at, the iData just got like merged together with all the other junk. So like if I pull up Notepad again, oh well, it's, it's not that insane in this one. And some of them, it's split between multiple different sections. But so anyways, we want to go look at the imports address table and see, okay, it is not binding its imports right now, right? Well, one way we could figure that out is we could just go to the data directory in the optional header. And we could go down to the bound import table. We could see, okay, there is no bound import table. So there are no structures to help the operating system sanity check bound imports. So even if we bound them, it wouldn't matter because the operating system would still just do what it always does because it has no data structure here. But anyways, we can, uh, you know, go to the import address table right there and see that as usual, it looks like it's pointing at, you know, some RVA of a hint and a string. All right, so now we're going to close this. Just uh, from within P view, just select file close because we want to keep that thing open. Now we're going to open CFF Explorer, which theoretically is on your desktop. Probably four, so maybe it's here. Anyone see a chili pepper? Oh, there it is. Okay, CFF Explorer folder. And then CFF Explorer.exe. And from there, we're going to open that Hello World again. So you go to your desktop, code, life of binaries, life of binaries, debug, hello world.exe. All right, so now CFF Explorer is a P view sort of equivalent, but with more powers. Uh, but it definitely does a lot more interpretation for you, which can be bad when learning, but which is good eventually. So for instance, we saw before the P view, we could see, let's say, you know, we could see each section as like a separate thing in the side window. So you could expand that text, expand that data, et cetera. In CFF Explorer, for instance, section headers, you would have to go in here, you'd select that text here, and then this would be the dot text data down here, et cetera. So anyways, that's not what we care about for now, but you can play around with that later. Play around with it tonight, for instance. Just go grab CFF Explorer off the internet, grab PE view, go open up Notepad, open up Hello World, whatever. All right, so the thing we care about here is the rebuilder option on the side. So I don't know what the rebuild P header option does, but it always seems to mess stuff up for me. So uncheck that. And we want to select the bind import table. So right now when we have hello world.exe open, we're selecting bind import table. We click on rebuild. And so now it's, it's bound to the import table. And then I'm just going to go to file and save. And then I'm just going to You can see that rebuild P error is saying, like I said, that 
filter because now this thing, which definitely does have a dot tag style for it and everything else, now it's uh, it doesn't think there's any more section. But it does have an import bond. It does have what? The, the uh, import bound table is there. Import bound. Which fields do we even care about and why? All right, who's got a feel for me? Who haven't I called on yet? Uh, uh, I call on you, David? I think I did. Well, go ahead. Do something. Uh, one I was looking at image base. Image base. Make sure, because I said this wrong last time. Yes, image base. Why, though? Why do we care? Well, it tells you where the, the binary expects to be loaded in virtual memory. Right. It tells you the preferred load address for this binary in virtual memory. Right? And so, uh, what do we know about EXEs versus DLLs versus system files? Well, DLLs can be locatable. Uh, EXEs, they prefer not to be paged out from the kernel, but in the user space, they don't have a choice. What about EXEs with respect to the base address, the image base address? Say that again? What about EXEs? So, yes, you said DLLs are relocatable, right? So, they're, they have a preferred image base, but the OS can move them around if it wants. What about EXEs? So EXEs, that's where you, you're supposed to put them, but I'm pretty sure you have to put them in. Right. So at least on something like non-ALSR versions of executables, the OS loader will always put the EXE at its preferred address and then it, you know, locates all the DLLs around it as spaces available. So EXEs, the image base, that's where it's preferred and that's where it gets. And it literally can't go anywhere else because by default, uh, it doesn't have relocation information unless you explicitly use that one fixed slash no, or fixed colon no linker option. And then for uh, kernel modules? Kernel modules, they prefer not to be picked out and they believe not be loading. No. So for kernel modules, well, yes about the first thing, no about the second. Yeah. For kernel modules, the OS loader apparently, at least on XP, doesn't care what they put as the image base. It's going to load them wherever it feels like. So even if that memory address is currently free, it still just like gives it wherever. So unlike DLLs, where DLLs, it's like if the image, if the address is free, it's going to put it there. For kernel modules, if the address is free, it doesn't care. It's just going to put it wherever it feels like. All right. To someone on the phone, uh, who can give me another uh, portion of the optional header that we care about? Uh, did we do address of entry point? Yep, address of entry point. No, we did not do that, and yes, that's correct. So why do we care about it? Let's see, that's where, um, was it the loader starts uh, the code? Yes, correct. That's where the OS loader, when it's done with all of its other stuff, like importing addresses, doing relocations, which we talk about later, once it's done with all of its miscellaneous things, it then goes to that address and starts executing code at the address of entry point, which is an RVA. It's a relative virtual address into the module. All right, someone else on the phone? Give me another one. Section alignment. Sorry, say again. Section alignment. Close. Uh, section alignment. Yes. So, section alignment, we care about why? We care about section alignment because we I heard we care about section alignment because we. Is that a backing off on answer or? All right. So, yes, yeah, could be. All right. We care about section alignment because of section alignment is potentially used to say that when the OS loader is grabbing chunks of the file and sticking them into memory, uh, this particular executable may say, I want these to be aligned on boundaries of this size. And it may ask for it, it may not ask for it, it sort of depends. All right? No. <laughs> okay. Who said no? All right, who's got another one? Uh, let's see. Drew, did you give me one yet? Let's see, we've checked off this one.
checked off this one, checked off this one. Who's got another one on the phone? Corey says data directory. Corey says okay. data directory. We'll look at uh, yeah. DLL characteristics. Okay, I heard Drew say one as well. What? DLL characteristics? Okay, Drew, why do we care about... That's yep, why do we care about DLL characteristics? Well, doesn't that tell us things about uh, ASLR compatibility and... Yeah, SEH stuff. Yep, so there's a variety of, well, the reason we care about it is there's a variety of security options in the DLL characteristics. ALSR compatibility, NX compatibility, aka DEP compatibility, um, whether or not you use structured exception handlers and whether you're going to force a digital signature check when, before the code is allowed to run. And then uh, Corey said the data directory. Corey, why do we care about the data directory? Right, and so Corey said uh, we care about the data directory because we've got, you know, structures that we need for parsing the IAP and then it will turn out a bunch of other <coughs> data, right? Exactly, all, bunch, all sorts of other fun metadata is in the data directory. All right, so let's see if there's any more left. Fix that out. All right, I see... One, two, I see two more things. Grant says file alignment. Yep, file alignment. And size of image, yep. So Grant got file alignment. We got size of image. Grant, why do we care about uh, file alignment? He's typing. Yep, I see it. Right, so the file alignment has to do with you can only write chunks to the file in sizes of this file alignment. And uh, that potentially means that if you have just a small amount of data in a section or something like that, you could end up with a larger amount of padding on the file uh, where it's padded up to the file alignment size. And so you need to keep that, be aware of that because sometimes you'll have that case where the file size is actually smaller than the virtual size. And it would only be because you had some file alignment padding. All right, and then Galen, you said, um, was it size of image? Why do we care about that? Right. Yep, it tells the OS, you know, right away the OS loader knows it needs to allocate at least this much space. You know, there's no way you're going to be able to fit telnet.exe in unless you have at least hex 3000 worth of space or whatever it is. So, yep. What about checksum? Sorry, say again. What about checksum? Yeah, we do actually care about checksum, and we'll see it later why we care about <laughs> checksum in the sense that uh, the virus code won't work unless you fix up checksum. But uh, most of the time, we, well, most of the time, the checksum is not going to be correct, so it doesn't matter. It's kind of a case of either the checksum is correct and the executable works, or the checksum is not. So, yeah, we didn't go over it, but uh, in some sense, yes, we do care about it. If you go to modify your code and put in a jump somewhere. No, so in that case, actually, is checksum would only be checked when the OS loader is loading this file from disk into memory, right? So if your code is running already and you modify so the code some point afterwards, the checksum is not going to get checked. It's only at the time when we load this in to memory, the uh, loader would potentially check the checksum. Any time after the thing's loaded into memory, it doesn't care anymore. So in other words, if I had the calculator program and somehow I installed that during runtime, it wouldn't be detected. But if somebody started it up again and brought and brought it into memory, the checksum would be checked, and then it would be discovered. Um, it wouldn't necessarily discover your version that you said you already had running in memory. For instance, it'll just recognize that the one currently being loaded off of disk is in memory, right? So if you're talking about you would like injected calc.exe into memory through some exploit or something like that, uh, then yeah, loading a new calc.exe is not going to somehow discover your exploit version in memory somewhere else. 
all it's going to do is say to me. So it's dependent on the life cycle of the thing. In other words, when I'm first installing the system, it'll check the checksum, but after that, it's oh know, no, no, it's not like I, it's I not like this? a checksum where it's checking at install time. It's checking the OS loader is checking it at program launch time. So when you double click on calc.exe, that's when the OS loader checks the checksum. Yep. So then if you modified it, it would know, right? After right. you know, so if you reloaded exact, it. Well, again. yeah, so the point is, yes, the virus code that we have, our virus lab tomorrow, it's going to go in and it's going to modify executables. If it doesn't fix the checksum, which it doesn't, I, I force you to use CFF Explorer to fix the checksum. If it doesn't fix the checksum, then yes, uh, the program will not be able to load, for instance, right? The OS loader will say, this program has been modified. Uh, the checksum is not correct. I'm going to not load it. Is there like a list of checksums per program, or is it that you could modify the checksum to equal exactly. the existing quote, viral program and then get exactly. away with it? Exactly. In practice, you know, there would be no point of going around looking for bad checksums. It would be the same thing as if you went around looking for hashes of files, right? So the virus would, any weaponized virus would absolutely modify the checksum so that it's correct. Uh, the new virally modified code would be, have a correct checksum in order to run, basically. So I just don't do that so that our virus is actually limits its own spread. So I guess checksum isn't all that important in us. Right. Up. That's why we didn't, uh, that's why we, we care about it in some sense, but it wasn't one of the ones that we actually listed that we care about. <laughs> Had to ask. Yep. Thank you. All right. So, does anyone have any questions on the stuff that we went over today? You know, I think you should definitely uh, go home tonight and play with CFF Explorer, play with PE View. You know, go download the code that we have. Go look through, go read the things about, like, the import address table modification code, right, the one that hooked to the import address table. Read that, read references, stuff like that. And then uh, come back tomorrow if you have any questions as well. We'll go